Let's have another rehearsal. Right through. Stand by for a more rehearsal. The things in my films, I haven't been able to invent stranger people than artists. I mean, you just go along and you film what their life's about, what their music's about, their art's about, and it is extraordinary. Of course it's extraordinary, because they're extraordinary people. This is the first of a two-part series about the highly personal and successful English filmmaker Ken Russell. His work began with several short films, virtually homemade. And there are a series of biographies of famous composers for the British Broadcasting Corporation. Elgar, Delius, Debussy, Prokofiev, Strauss, the dancer, Isadora Duncan. A few of these have been seen on American television to great acclaim. Turning to feature-length films, Ken Russell made Billion Dollar Brain, about a millionaire maniac who tries to take over the country, Women in Love, from the D.H. Lawrence story, The Music Lovers, about the life of Tchaikovsky, The Boyfriend, a surreal film treatment of the stage classic, and the controversial and often banned film The Devils, which has probably played nowhere in the world in its original uncut version. His last release was Savage Messiah, a more or less true story of the sculptor Henri Godier and his love for Sophie Breschka. In this scene, Henri and Sophie, played by Scott Antony and Dorothy Tootin, agree to share each other's lives and names. Let us plight our truth. Yes. Let us plight our truth. Are you sure? Yes. Then we must give each other something. Something that will last forever. I'll give you my name. I'll give you mine. Henri Godier Breschka. Sophie Godier Breschka. I am your brother. Your sister. You are my love. See, you're revolting against his father and swear. In this program, Mr. Russell talks with his friend, the writer and critic Colin Wilson. Mr. Wilson is perhaps best known in America for his book, The Outsider, a study of modern man in contemporary fiction. They are talking in Russell's office overlooking Marble Arch and Hyde Park in London's West End. Russell is describing his first infatuation with films. I, I lived in this sort of fantasy world, this Hollywood world. And also when I was a child, I had very few friends. I lived in a street where no children ever came. And my world was made up of heroes and heroines of the silver screen. And I acted out these sort of fantastic films of Flash Gordon and so forth that I used to see. And I, they were more real to me than anything else. What did you intend to do when you left school? Well, 
I never really knew what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to, because I was in love with Dorothy L'Amour, I wanted to go away to the South Seas and um, stay there forever and uh, just lie on the beach with a, a, um, an exotic native lady, drinking coconut juice and making love, I suppose. And uh, I thought the best way to, get, uh, to, get, um, to achieve this, and my father, although he didn't know this secret dream of mine, aided and abetted it, really, was to go to the Nautical College Pangbourne, where, which, um, so I could achieve, you know, something on the sea, become an officer, that my father was only a ship's detective and steward you know, couldn't attain. So he was very proud that I should um, um, become an officer and go to sea, not knowing this fantastic ambition. Well, I did set sail um, for uh, the South Seas, but we bypassed all the islands and ended up in Australia, which I thought was the most horrific place I'd ever seen in my life. Really? Yeah. And also we had a sadistic captain who used to make you stand in the sun for eight hours a day looking for enemy submarines. This was after the war had been over for six months. <laughs> and he used to stand naked on his hands, I don't know why, on the bridge. And he had a, a, a very broad Scots accent. And he used to give me orders that I couldn't possibly understand. So I, I would be lowering the boats in the middle of the sea for, <laughs> and saying abandon ship and so forth. And I, I don't think he thought I was much of a sailor. And neither did I, so I, I opted out of that. But before I'd, even before I got into this um, seafaring nonsense, I soon realized when I was at the Nautical College that even though the South Seas may be very desirable, um, all these films I'd seen of the South Seas were probably better, really, mm. than the South Seas. And so I, I became totally immersed in, in Hollywood fantasy. And we had divisional concerts at the school, and they were usually consisted of um, cadets in, in uh, naval caps and grey trousers and white sweaters, um, singing The Fishermen of England are working at their nets. Well, I had a chance to put on a concert, so I got everyone in drag, dressed them up as Carmen Miranda, got rugger socks and stuffed them up their jumpers so they were very voluptuous. And um, the commander of the school nearly had a fit, and I had to leave <laughs> at the end of that. Did you? Pra yeah, <laughs> practically, yeah. And what did you do then? Well, I, I did go into this. That's when I went to the Merchant Navy. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Didn't see Dorothy Lamour, became disillusioned with the whole thing, and decided that if I couldn't live in a fantasy world in the South Seas, I'd better make my own. And uh, I thought, well, maybe, I, maybe one can get into films. Maybe one could make films, because I'd even made one of those when I was at the nautical school, a very short one. And um, so I went round all the English studios, there were about eight in those days. That was in about 1946. And got not much further than the gate of the studios. And uh, because it was a terrible, decadent, sliding downhill setup in those days, the, it was Im almost impossible to get into the British film industry unless you were the son of a, a cameraman or a director, you know, that, mm. and, or had an old school tie, or one of which I did have, but it was, didn't, mm. nautical school ties weren't quite right. So I, mm. I was turned away. And then for about eight years, I did other things, all in a way to do with films. I became a ballet dancer, I took up photography, I became an actor. I failed at all these things. I was totally hopeless at them all, but I was at least gaining experience. And eventually, I, I saved up enough money as a photographer to make three amateur films, which I showed to the BBC. And they, they um, gave me a job. When I was a photographer, I used to take fantasies and dramatic photographs and weird nonsense shots of um, mostly to do with dreams and fantasy. And this is a picture of my wife in one of my dream fantasy sequences. I was never very good as a fashion photographer because in the days when I was attempting it, Cecil Beaton with a, a white carnation was the um, epitome of what a photographer should be. Um, it was, um, if only it was now, you know, I'd be fine because I'm dirty and wear jeans and I'm filthy and unshaved. Uh, what were these three films you made about to get a job at the BBC? Well, they were, um, they were amateur films. I mean, they, they were... I, I, when I was a photographer, I was always doing features on um, what they, uh, you know, what, what happened to stray dogs, that they were all butchered and put into cans of meat and so on and so forth, and I was getting punched in the face for doing so. <laughs> and I got a bit bored with this, and it wasn't a nice scene anyway. And whenever I could, I... I um, made up um, photo essays, that's a rather pretentious word coming from life, which I now died, I gather. 
but also they, they were just atmospheric um, visualizations of things that interest me. For, for instance, on my honeymoon, my wife and I went to the Bronte country. We went to Haworth, where they lived. And uh, we, she was always mad on period costumes. That's why she, I think the costumes are so good in, in our films. Um, and I, I got to dress up as Charlotte Bronte and tranced her about the moors in the pouring rain and nearly got pneumonia and I took rather, I thought, quite nice pictures. And uh, I was very interested in that sort of thing. I, and, but yeah. there was no real sale for that, so one couldn't live on it. And also it was very frustrating because you, one should have had a cine camera and not a still camera to do these things. Mm. Uh, so eventually I saved up enough money to get one. And the first film I did was um, called Peep Show. And it was... Uh, a fantasy, um, rather sort of a cross between Fellini and Pabst, and it was uh, about uh, a, a group of beggars, street beggars, who, on their um, usual pitch, found uh, another uh, group of people who they persecuted, and there was it was mixed up with fantasy and magic and so forth, and uh, it, it was a little fairy fairy story really, but nobody wanted it and it wasn't very good. So, um, this about this time, I became a Catholic. And uh, which we can talk about later, but the um, I suddenly had a great fervor to do Catholic films. You know, I saw the Red Balloon, which I thought was utterly fantastic. So I conceived, because um, I always pinch from other people. I've stopped doing it now because, well, I've I don't see any new people. The old people, I'm a bit tired of. But anyway, I, I so I thought that was a jolly good story to pinch from. It's just a boy going after a balloon. So I had a, a little girl in an end of school play who is an angel, and she takes her wings home against the teacher's instructions uh, to show her mum, mother. But her brother gets hold of them, and being, being a typical little brother, he smashes them to pieces. And so the girl is very upset, and she has six hours to comb London to find a pair of angel's wings. And that was the story. The, the weird people she meets on the way, and um, of course, being... Um, um, you know, a child's film and a fairy story. It had a happy ending. She did find her wings. She sees an angel rushing through Hyde Park, uh, with great big wings on. And so she follows her, goes into a great big house, and of course it's an artist's model being painted by an artist. And uh, the artist gives her a little pair of wings, clips them on, and off she goes. <laughs> Amelia was a great success on, on the sort of art circuit thing, you know. But um, I thought, well, it's not going to get me a job in the BBC. They're, I've got to do a documentary for that. So we took a cheap charter trip to Lourdes, and um, I shot there for a week in all weathers, snow, rain, fog, everything, the same scenes. And the, it had, the film had a sort of, and I just cut it to music. There's no dialogue in it except the... Um, 
the, the words are the um, vision was supposed to have uttered. They were just the entire commentary. And we cut it to Benjamin Britten's music, and it was my first sort of excursion into the power of music and image. So that film in Amelia I showed to the BBC. And um, I got a job on this program, Monitor, which was um, the first arts program um, ever done on television. That was about 1959. What was your first film for Monitor? Well, I gave, I gave them a list of six ideas, and um, ranging from Al Albert Schweitzer in the jungle with lepers playing the organ, which they thought might be rather <laughs> difficult to bring about, to um, John Betjeman walking around London talking about his poems, which seemed much cheaper and, uh, and more desirable. So, um, and, and that turned out to be a very, very good move. I couldn't have chosen a better subject, because I think that if you're... It was the first film that I'd, I'd ma ever made that was seen by more than a million... I mean, seen by a million, a couple of million people. And um, if it had been a flop, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now. You know, I'd be still back at photography doing that. So I was fortunate in, in getting a, a, a poem. You can't get a better script than a poem because it's concise, it's clear, clear images. And if, you, if your film's got to last as long as a poem, which is about 15 seconds to a minute or two minutes or whatever, his were a, a, a about, 30, about a minute then you've got, to, you can't, you've got to know exactly in your mind precisely the message you want to get across with that line. That line dictates what you've got to do. You, you needn't necessarily, and I didn't, uh, just do a mirror image of that line. You can counterpoint it with another image, you know, with your own, which, which says something else about what he's saying, and that's what we did. Um, but I ended up then with six little filmlets, they were, the whole thing lasted about 15 minutes, of London, spoken by Benjamin. And as I say, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful discipline. And I feel if ever I get the time, I'd like to pick up someone like Yevtushenko or um, Blake, anyone, and force myself to write a script for each of their poems, because it really makes you stretch your imagination like, like nothing else I've ever known. From the geezer ventilators, autumn winds are blowing down on a thousand business women having baths in Camden Town. Waste pipes chuckle into runnels, steams escaping here and there. Morning trains through Camden cutting shake the crescent and the square. Early nip of changeful autumn, dahlias glimpsed through garden doors. At the back, precarious bathrooms jutting out from upper floors. And behind their frail partitions, business women lie and soak, seeing through the drafty skylight, flying clouds and railway smoke. Rest you there, poor unbeloved ones, lap your loneliness in heat. All too soon, the tiny breakfast, trolley bus and windy street. What music films did you make for the BBC Monitor programme? Well, I started off, they were very keen on um, um, living artists, and we, we, we actually, eventually, we got through all the living artists, Henry Moore and, and co., um, pretty rapidly, and uh, so we had to start um, digging up the dead, which suited me very well, because I, um, we were all, they were sort of more or less commercials for living artists. You know, we very rarely attacked yeah. them. And, um, in fact, it was a program really celebrating the joy and the um, extraordinary benefits to be got out of art. And, and, and I think it succeeded because it was d designed to reach everyone on a popular level. Mm. We, um, it succeeded in those terms. And we realized when we were dealing with a difficult um, composer or, or uh, when we were dealing with a difficult artist, we really had to grab the audience who weren't used to seeing art on television. They never had mm. seen it. And if you, if you would have come up and said, um, uh, the announcer said, and now, viewers, 10.30 on a Sunday evening, you are going to see the life of Debussy. They'd have reached for their switches so fast. Mm. Uh, we had two channels then, commercial and BBC, and they, you would have never seen anything. So we soon realized this. And we devised things whereby, before they could actually walk for five yards to turn the switch, we'd smash them back in their seat. For instance, in, in this Debussy film, I 
started it with a, a girl in a T-shirt, very glamorous. She's nailed to a cross on the seashore with waves breaking over. You cut to other glamorous girls with Aquarius and so forth written on their T-shirts, and they've got bows and arrows, and they go... <laughs> and they just fill her full of arrows. Well, you're going to think <laughs> twice before you get up. And also, she's uh, loving it. You're, uh, you're going to think twice before you turn it off. The, um, the, the earliest music film I did was on Prokofiev, which was just a compilation of newsreel shots and old Eisenstein films all linked together. And um, it was just a sort of higgledy-piggledy scrapbook of music and Russian pictures. It was quite a, a vivid thing. It was the first time we'd ever depicted an artist with an actor. And even though we just had his hands playing the piano, this was considered to be, well, stepping outside the bounds of true documentary and might lead the audience astray. Why, I don't know. You know but they were very hooked onto this thing of only showing picture postcards of people mm. who were dead instead of actors. But we gradually overcame this as the years go by. And the film that really did that was for the 100th anniversary of Monitor, been going two years then, in which I did this film on Algar. And I saw him as a great hero on a white horse riding over the Malvern Hills. In fact, that's how the film opens. Mm. And um, he was a very sort of nature, a poet of nature as well as a, a seer into the Edwardian scene. I think if you... If you listen to his second symphony, which was written in 1910, you know that the great wars are around the corner, that the whole scene, which seems on the, on the surface so glamorous and full of life and likely to exist for another century, is going to die. And I think that's one of the great missions, one of, one of the great values of an artist. He's a mystic, a seer into the, into the future, and a capsulator and a condenser of vast events. And I think particularly in music, one discovers this. Yeah. It's all there, but in such vivid humanistic terms and imaginative terms that if you just will go with it and be turned on to it, the rewards, I think, are staggering and terribly enriching. And it was also the longest film that the program had ever shown. It was an hour long and sort of a little feature film. And although they were still very puritanical about the use of actors, Algar never actually spoke in the film, and he was played by about six different people as he went through his life. Yeah. Um, he was usually in long shot or in the room, and this was gradually accepted. So I, I eventually made inroads into this puritanical documentary approach. But even mm. so, even in those days, I was be being accused of doing things that weren't true to the artist. For instance, I had Algar, this very staid in many ways, at least that was the popular image, um, Edwardian gentleman, uh, Sir Edward Algar, as he eventually became, um, flying kites on Northern Hills. Well, rather, you know, Sir Edward Algar flying kites, rather ridiculous. And the editor of the programme, Hugh Weldon, said, well, this is a romantic image. I can see it's his music flying in the air and all that, but it, you really can't have it. And I said, well, I'm sorry, old boy, but he did actually used to send telegrams to Greenwich Observatory every day and say, what force will the wind be on the Malvern Hills this evening at six o'clock? You've been criticised for making your portraits of artists too destructive. Gabriel Rossetti, the poet, destroyed his wife, practically drove her to suicide. Um, Debussy caused his wife and mistress to shoot themselves. Um, who else is there? And Delius. Delius just totally destroyed one man's life. And Richard Strauss practically destroyed a nation. Uh, which man's so, life did Delius destroy? Well, it's a very interesting story. Delius is the only person, um, the only film I've made, in which a person, about a person who was living at the time. The Delius film is really about an old syphilitic, cantankerous, blind composer, um, very senile, at the end of his tether, at the end of his years, about 70 or 80, getting, I mean, practically dead. And of a young Yorkshire, simple boy, hearing his music one day on the radio in 1923 and thinking this is the most magnificent music I've ever heard. It does something to me that transforms my life. And he read that Delius was blind. So in a very naive way, he wrote a letter to this old man in, Paris, in, in France and said, uh, could I help you? If you have any more music in your mind that you can't see to write down, I'd be delighted. He was a bit of a musician. He, he, he was a bit of starting composing. He was only, only in his 20s, early 20s and he played in the village band and so forth. And Delius wrote back and said, come over. Well, he came over, and for about 
five years, Delius um, dictated and with the help of Fenby digging out and making him remember and forcing him to work in a way, Delius wrote about three or four more fantastic pieces of music which would never have seen the light of day. But it, it came about that when I went to Paris, to France, to look at the scene where this took place, I went with um, Eric Fenby, who is now 60, and um, a frustrated composer. He always feels that Delius killed, killed him, mm. spiritually and artistically. He gave, really? gave himself totally mm. to him. So we, we came to shoot the film, and I said to Fenby, well, you must come and see some of the filming. And he, he, he was uh, very different about it. He said, no, it might put the boy playing me off. It was Christopher Gable who's been in some of my films. It might put him off, and he might, he might uh, it wouldn't be a good idea. I said, well, come sometime. Don't tell us, just drop in. And uh, we were just filming the scene where Delius is sitting blind in his chair, and his wife, Yalka, brings the boy in, who's going to be with him for five years, and says, Delius, I'd like you to see Mr. Fenby. And he said, Good afternoon, sir. It's very nice to see you. So very, very banal stuff. And we heard a sort of sobbing in the corner. We turned round, and there was Eric Fenby looking at a scene. He'd explained to me in great detail, so I shot it exactly as he told me, that had happened to him 40 years before. And it was, the experience was too much for him. Afterwards, he said to me, I was back 40 years. It was me speaking to Delius. And he looks like Delius so much in the atmosphere, so right, that... I just was possessed by, it was too much the shock, and I, I'm sorry, I broke down and cried. And he saw the film afterwards, and again, it brought back the fact that he had sacrificed his life. I mean, it came over in the film. Yeah. Making a film on a, a, a dead person, or an event that happened, is like a detective story, and it's also like a journey in a time machine. And it's also like a vision. You have to immerse yourself in the music or the art of that person. And I think if you know about them as much as is known and you do this, the chances are if you're tuned into them and you've got to be mad about them or understand them as much as possible, and with an abstract art like music, that might not be easy, to such an extent that you just do it. And I, 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 I get the feeling that sometimes it works in, in, in certain scenes in my films, and I know that what we're doing is right, even if it's not in the detail of exactly what they wore, but to the spirit of what happened at that time. And it's a very weird, uncanny experience. Yeah. Monitor uh, was made up of um, artists and gentlemen and um, poets, and it was almost like an ideal, utopian world. Mm -hmm. There'd be half a dozen of us, and we, we were just meet every Monday and discuss our programs, discuss our films, discuss what we want to do, and do it. Yeah. And, 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 and then you come into the feature film world, and you find that I haven't found six people in the whole time I've been in feature films who have been equal to those people working in television, who were idealists. me getting an idea. Last week, the first of this two-part series on the career of English film director Ken Russell explored his early films, his work for Monitor of the BBC, his life in commercial photography, and the great influence music has had in his life. This program focuses on his work in feature films. Billion Dollar Brain. The D.H. Lawrence story, Women in Love, which stars the actress he has often used, Glenda Jackson. His somewhat fictionalized biography of Tchaikovsky, The Music Lovers, which featured Richard Chamberlain. The Boyfriend, starring Twiggy. A film version of Aldous Huxley's study of the tortured 17th century priest Grandier, titled The Devils, starring another favorite actor of Russell's, Oliver Reed and Savage Messiah with Dorothy Tootin and Scott Antony. Ken Russell talks with writer-critic Colin Wilson in Mr. Russell's office near Marble Arch in London's West End. What about these first two feature films, French Dressing and Billion Dollar Brain? I suppose they were fairly conventional films. I saw Billion Dollar Brain the other day, and I, I quite liked it. It was better than I thought it was, because it must be the, the first film was made, say, about five or six years ago, which showed um, American Texans as ter fantastic fascists. They were the 
And General Midwinter, who ran um, an, a, an oil refinery, wanted to invade Russia. I was mad. I mean, he's based on a character Harry Saltzman actually met and knew who did want to invade Russia and thought that the Reds were polluting the west coast by poison air, which they were filtering across from Siberia. And the hero of Billion Dollar Brain was um, Colonel Stock, the Russian MKVD. A nice, very nice gentleman, but not nice really, but a saint compared with this Texan fascist. And uh, the Russians uh, stopped this maniac invading Latvia and brought about world <laughs> peace, for which we shall always be grateful. <laughs> That's why we're sitting here now, because of billion dollar brain. Sometimes I seek divine inspiration on the set. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. This was one of the moments. This uh, One of the uh, elements in your films that's aroused uh, quite a lot of criticism is this um, very strong satire. You, obviously, you not only have a very strong satirical element, there's a, almost at times a sort of Blackpool dirty postcard humour uh, that adds to this satire, I think. Uh, the satirical element does seem to be very strong in you. Do you see yourself as a satirist? Not really. I, I, what I do like doing is taking the wind out of people's sails to make a point. I like leading them along a certain way. And then when they're just sort of dozing off or they, they think they've got it to crash, you really, you, you've got to make, you, you can't do it all the time, otherwise they're shattered and they don't know what's happened and they, they lose track. But I think you're, you're telling the story along and suddenly you've got to do something totally unexpected, which is actually somehow or other got something to do with the story or making a certain point. Ignorance and crafty provincials like us cannot see beyond the city walls. And so they're ordered to be torn down. Will it broaden our view? Such men, sire, have little vision. Their loyalties are to their cities, not to France. Yes. When a man is intent on power, as Richelieu is, he can justify his actions with absurdities. Fortifications provide opportunities for Protestant uprising. Yes! With our walls gone, we shall be defenseless at the mercy of any enemy as weak and as helpless as a country village. And with the security of our independence gone, our freedoms would go too. We must write to the king, declare our loyalty, and trust in his wisdom and justice. No! All the others, if you like, Richelieu, if you can manage it. But not Loudon. We once promised dear old Saint Mart, the late lamented governor, that we would never touch one teeny weeny stone of his precious city. You would surely not expect us to go back on our word. No, Your Majesty. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go, oh, pretty little bird. <laughs> Fly away. Fly away. <laughs> <laughs> Another Protestant bird for your bag, Richelieu? Honourably done, Your Majesty. Bye-bye, Blackbird. <laughs> 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 shooting um, blackbirds, and they're Protestant. Yeah. They're, they're people dressed up, they run along, and he shoots them. People said, how ridiculous, ridiculous. Well, I didn't know much about Louis XIV. I knew several. I knew he loved dressing up in drag, which is why at the beginning I have him as a drag queen coming out of a shell as the birth of Venus. I knew that. I knew he was a crack shot and loved shooting. I knew he loved shooting blackbirds. In fact, he dressed up as, um, um, in one of his plays, he dressed up as um, a blackbird killer. And he also hated Protestants who he associated with blackbirds. So it would seem logical. I mean, out of that mad information is all I had about him, except that he also loved making candy floss, but I couldn't see how to... I think no one would have believed that. 
Um, out of all these things, I cre I, it made, you know, a, a sur surrealist moment, but one which was based on fact. And I think that all the, all the sort of way out things in my films that suddenly occur are based on a sort of conglomeration of strange facts which also make a point at the same time. Now, this is something I really would like to go into, this surrealistic feeling about so much of your work. It's always seemed to me that, in a way, your work is very much a direct follow-on from German Romanticism, not only of the 19th century, but as it was transmuted in the early 20th century in Expressionism, and then in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and so on. Yes. The strange, obsessive weirdness. Well, those, all the things you've mentioned have had the greatest impact on me of anything I've ever seen. I mean, the German Expressionist films, Fritz Lang films, uh, Jean Vigo was a surrealist as well, a French director, yes. and, um, and Scriabin, they're all, they're all, they're all on, on, a, on a, a slightly, un, they, they, they're unrealistic. They transcend realism to make a realistic point or um, a philosophic point or whatever it might be. And they used all sorts of expressions to heighten reality. And instead of, um, I mean, all this fantasy and so forth, in a way, should dispel reality. But I, I know for a fact that um, fantastic elements have a far greater effect, even if they're not totally understood by the audience, than very realistic things. Mm -hmm. And I think this is partially due to the fact that people are inundated with realism on television 24 hours a day, practically. Mm -hmm. And they have come to accept it, and it means nothing to them. Unfortunately, it means nothing to them. And whether they knew... Well, I mean, I think all art has been about that from the beginning. Um, there's realistic art is usually bad art. Only... Mm -hmm. And I think the trouble with film is that everyone thinks of it as, because of the Hollywood, the, the, the 30s realism of Hollywood, and also the 30s phoniness of Hollywood, which has passed off as realism. If you do something extraordinary in a film which is supposed to be out a real person or a realistic person, but you suddenly do something surrealistic, because it's film and because for 50 years we've sat there bored as hell watching these fairy stories from Hollywood, people think it's cheating. Whereas in, in any painting, you walk into any gallery, nothing is real. I mean, they, they, it's a wonder that everyone says, well, that's ridiculous, that Picasso, he's not, he's not got two heads. Well, they, they stopped saying that 50 years ago. Yeah. But so far as film is concerned, they expect it to be realistic if you're treating a realistic subject. And then suddenly, if you do a little twist like that, everyone, I do it because it gets through this barrier of them just sitting there and thinking, this is realistic, it's happening to do something extraordinary that the mind isn't prepared for, you really cut through um, what I think is a gauze in front of people's minds. They've, they've got a built-in reaction. Again, that's why sometimes I will... A lot of people accuse me in The Devils of um, sensationalism. Well, Huxley's novel, which I adapted the thing from, is far... I mean, if I had filmed that novel, it, it wouldn't be allowed anywhere. You know, so yeah. it's... Uh, I'm afraid it's not as good as the novel, insofar as it's not as forceful as fantastic. Um, when people read, oh, it's not a novel, it's a documentary on the event, when people read it, the written word takes so long to filter through their mind and they can censor it. So if there's an appalling description of Grandier having his legs crushed, for instance, they, either because they haven't got a vivid imagination or because they, read, they have to read the words one after the other, then translate it into a picture or it's almost simultaneous, but there is a time lag, they can put up a barrier so that they're not destroyed. Because I think it's, if you, if you didn't have a barrier all the time, and all these forces of horror, which we see every day on television, hit you, and you took them at full value, you'd be destroyed. Mm. Well, in a film, there's not time to react, to, to put up the barrier. Suddenly, an image comes on they're not expecting, and it takes them totally unawares, and they re react against it. And I think that's why a lot of the critics don't like my films. They like to be able to sit back and assess everything that happens step by step. Suddenly something happens, there's no defense, they, they, they're caught. And I think this is one very good way of getting a message across. And it's a very good way of stopping the people from in, in the audience from eating their peanuts and popcorn and so forth, and really grab them. I think you've got to continually grab them. Um, the other side, though, of German surrealism was the obsession with violence and the need for values to replace the violence. Romanticism was all the time yes. looking for, for some ideal beyond it, which you also seem to have very strongly in your... Yes, mind. I mean, that comes up in my... I mean, in, 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 the, in the Devils, 
the, the culmination of the film, which was the rape of Christ, which became very surrealist and psychedelic, and people who thought didn't really know what had happened, um, was contrasted with, which was the most decadent thing that had ever happened on the screen, was contrasted with uh, Grandier, the priest, who hadn't been a, led a very upright life up until that moment, um, finding himself in nature and finding God in nature. And so you've got the two contrasts. You've got the force of nature and truth and beauty against the corruption of a, a decadent society. And I think that's what all my films are about. Yeah. A quick word before I leave for home. The king was very sympathetic. After reading our petition, he dictated a letter ordering Le Bardemont to leave our walls intact. I could hardly believe that so important a thing could be settled so easily. The more I think about it, the more it seems that the king's heart was moved by something more than usual good sense and understanding. Each morning I wake up with a feeling of optimism so strong as to be almost absurd. The truth of the matter is that Richelieu rules the king. At the moment the king is smiling on us, but that may not last too long. We will need help and courage. Strange thoughts come to me. I am like a man who has been lost, who has always been lost. Now, for all kinds of reasons, I have a vague sense of meaning and can think of myself as a small part of God's abundance, which includes everything. And I know I want to serve it. I want to serve the people of Loudon. I want to serve you. Pray for us all, especially me. Uh, what about um, the boyfriend? This seemed a complete breakaway from this rather grim image you'd got before then. Well, it was, um, and I, I, The De Devils was a very depressing film to do insofar as if you're dealing with exploitation of human beings and, and, and depraved souls depraving other people, th this, this does have an effect on you and you become very depressed. I mean, a film takes a year to do or nine months to do, and at the end of it, one wanted a total change, one wanted to uh, cut off from controversy and horror and um, make something totally enjoyable and happy. films being what they are, involving such a great number of people, um, 
And the fact that England hadn't made a musical for, well, God knows, ever, in Hollywood terms, nothing to equal any Hollywood musical, um, the industry just wasn't geared for it. And the studio I made the film in, every set fell to pieces, uh, took, and um, everything took much longer to do. And we found these beautiful Hollywood floors that glisten black and glowing in, in the old films without hundreds of people tap dancing. One took them for granted, but when we actually came to do them, one found they were almost impossible to achieve because this studio was so old that it was like painting the fourth bridge, which is a very big bridge. You never quite finish it. You start at Wendy and then finish, and, and the time you get there, you go back. And we polished the, the black floor, and by the time we got to the end, and we only had about six people to do it, so everyone chipped in. It was grey again with the falling dust of years, of the decay of the British film industry. And we had to start again, and we never got it. I mean, simple things like that. One wasn't directing a film, one was window dressing, one was becoming a, a set decorator. And also, um, it, it should have been a happy experience, but you, you come up against sort of unpredictable things. I think films, unless they're really, you enjoy doing, and they're a waste of time. And we'd come up against a, a thing where we wanted just some background action of, um, there was a scene in an old film studio, and we wanted lots of films being shot at once, and we had an Arab film being shot, some sort of Arabs, um, and white people discovering an Egyptian tomb and so forth. And I said to the extras, right, well, you've got your guns, your Arabs, have a bit of a fight, you know, and just sort of something for the background. They said, sure, Ken, sure, they worked out a very good fight, and I said, fine, just gonna turn over, I say, action, I said, um, We'd like 30 pounds extra for the fight. You see, we've got a basic 10 pounds we want there. And I said, well, I'm afraid we're over budget already. We, we can't afford the 30 pounds. So I said, well, look, don't do the fight. Just march up and down with your rifles. You see, that would be something. So, right, turn over, action. Uh, Ken, um, marching up and down, well, that'll be 20 pounds extra, really. We're not fighting, but we're carrying a rifle. We're marching. Right, I said, well, look, don't march up and down. Just Stand there holding the rifle. So I said, okay, right, turn over, action. Uh, Ken, we're holding the rifle. Uh, you know, we're not bound to hold it. It's 10 pounds extra for holding a rifle. So I said, put the rifle down, stand still, do nothing. And they said, right. And they looked very grimly at me. And we did the scene, and they went, marched to their dressing room, smashed it to pieces. Go, yeah. Tore the door off, smashed the windows, destroyed their costumes. And, and well, people say to me, well, you, you lose your temper sometimes in films and all this, that. And you know. Well, for things like that, yeah, I sure do. Um, this is a portrait of um, an actor I had a bit of a row with, and I think he lost. But really, I found my experience of working with actors the same actors time and time again, without exception, even with the most brilliant Glenda Jackson that I have worked with, they have 10 tricks. Some brilliant people have got 11. And you say, you don't, if you're very cheeky and very friendly with them, like Oliver Reed, oh, he's only got three tricks. You say, mood, and they're all moody things. He does sort of look moody looks here and there. I say, moody too, and he just does it, and it's great. <laughs> Um, with other people, you have to be a bit more, you know, psychologically astute. And, uh, but it's a question of getting the right hoop and saying hoopla or alley oop in so many words to get them to jump through because they just got these tricks and they do the tricks and the tricks come out over and over again. And there's, I've never yet met an actor except possibly Alan Bates who wasn't a really a bag of tricks. And all this stuff about motivation and all that's a load of crap because I, in many films, have told them the scenes about one thing because I deliberately didn't want them to do what they wanted to do. Yeah. I've told them it's about something else. I've even done scenes, like in The Savage Messiah, where they're talking about one thing and I've decided it wasn't right after we shot it and I redubbed it. So they're saying entirely different things. And, the, and again, all this motivation, so it is nonsense. What is important in, in, um, in directing actors is in directing an inanimate object on the set instead. Suddenly saying, they're all ready to do the scene, they've got it preconceived in their way, you've talked it over, they know what to do, the camera's all set up and everything, and you say, that seam of your jacket is a quarter of an inch too high. This is ridiculous. Stop the whole thing, take it away, change it. Put on a new jacket right away, quick. And, they, and th that shakes them out. They put on the new jacket, and they're like that. And they're ready to go. And he said, that chair, get, 
that, who brought that chair in here? That, I didn't ask for that. The chairs only say, action! And they go on and they do something they haven't, that's from inside rather than from something they preconceive. That's how I direct actors. <laughs> I can see why you've got this reputation for being difficult on the set. Yes. <laughs> so I can say to that. Uh, it's not difficult, it's just yeah. being unpredictable. Mm, I think, yeah. you see, every setup, every, even if it's for a very simple scene, takes so long. People don't appreciate, you know, you shoot maybe two minutes a day, three minutes a day, five minutes, if you're very, very lucky, but usually it's a couple of minutes. Um, it's often seemed to me that you're almost as much a writer as you are a director. I mean, you don't take scripts from people and just film them as you get them. You almost seem to write your own scripts. Well, I do write some of them. I wrote... Um, from the Devils, uh, I mean, I took Huxley's play, The Devil, uh, Huxley's book, The Devils, and Whiting's play, and wrote the script out of that. From The Boyfriend, I, I adapted it from Sandy Wilson's show. And I also write them almost, not under the influence of drugs, but under the influence of music. I find, if I'm doing a film on The Devils, for instance, I found a particular symphony of Prokofiev's number three, which was adapted by him from his opera, The Fiery Angel, which was about precisely this same subject of possession of nuns or fake possession of nuns by the devil. And I played that over and over and it wasn't, his music isn't, doesn't sound like the 15th century, it sounds 20th. And, I suppose, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted the film to look 20th century in a way or slightly surrealist in a way. And so I, I inundated myself with this music and wrote the script almost under a hypnosis of the music. Mm. And I, I do that with, with all the things I work on. You seem to have these tremendous energies bubbling up in you all the time, and of course you've done five films in the past three years, haven't you? Women in Love, The Music Lovers, The Devils, The Boyfriend, and Savage Messiah. How long is it possible to continue at this tremendous rate of imaginative production? Well, I... Th the trouble is I've got so many stories that I, I want to do, and I, I know I'm not going to live forever. I might, uh, I might be dead next year, or the year after, or when I'm 50, or whenever, and I've got really... 500 more films to do, so I haven't got much time. Time's running out. And also, I think it's also something to do with the pace of the film themselves. The films are usually biographical and contain a whole lifetime concentrated into two hours, and, and this also makes one want to live at the same pressure oneself. Mm. One's concentrating all this energy of somebody into a couple of hours, and it just must rub off. So that unless, I mean, I'm only happy when I'm working. I, even when I'm walking in the country, I'm thinking of what I'm going to do next. I, if I actually had to sit down and do nothing, I would go insane for five minutes. Yeah. Yes, this business of concentrating things into biographies brings me to another point I do want to raise. This almost uh, an obsession you seem to have with the heroic, which seems to distinguish you completely from not only the modern trend in films, but in literature too, the notion that the hero is always defeated, always smashed flat at the end. Well, I, I suppose, in a way, this must come out again, of, come out of music. As the only way I can... I'm, and, and also my own experience. I mean, most music um, falls into um, a sort of pattern. I mean, Vaughan Williams is a good example of that. I mean, I find it a recurring theme in all his work, all his symphonies and in a lot of his ballets. But um, life starts off... I mean, Vaughan Williams said... Um, uh, we are the stuff that dreams are made of, and our life is rounded by a sleep. From Shakespeare, I think it was the Tempest, I know what it was from. And all his, all his work starts in fragments, as though he's coming from another existence, from another world, from another plane, and he's coming into existence. Then in the first movement of his symphony, which is the exposition, you get a fantastic energy and all sorts of influences and emotions overwhelming and a sense of struggle. Then, in the next movement, you usually get total betrayal, um, a crashing down. This comes in his ballet, Job. I mean, it's a very good example. And a betrayal by... And, and you get Job's comforters, who are the people who award medals to people like my grandfather after the Great War, who's a total cripple and a write-off, and think that's OK. That yeah. makes everything all right. And then you get total despair of someone shaking their fist against God and saying, damn the whole universe, damn God, damn everything. But there is something in human beings, innate, how it comes, why it's there, I don't know, that given a quarter of a chance or a millionth of a chance will survive any catastrophe, and if given just the breath of hope, will transcend any 
disaster. And most symphonies, and his in particular, end on a note of triumph after a terrific struggle. Now, this must be because it is man's nature. It just can't happen by chance. Mm. And I totally believe in this. I mean, I, we're in a very chancy business, the film business. I remember Brian Forbes, Forbes, the film director, saying to me when I was dubbing Tchaikovsky, we ha he happened to be working next door in another studio. He said, this doesn't sound a very commercial film. What are you going to do if it's a flop? Women in Love was a great success, commercial success. You know, what, what's this film? If it's no good, you're, uh, and John Schlesinger, Midnight Cowboy, great success. What if he does a film that's no good? And like me, he said, you'll be sitting in a hotel with your sleeves rolled up, hotel bed, and ready to slash your wrists. Well, that was the attitude, I think, of most 19th century romantics. They ha did have an insight into what nature, life, and existence was about. But they were so, they, they could see no optimism. Why, I don't know. That, that's another story. But they couldn't. They didn't. A lot of them killed themselves, and their works usually end on a depressing note. And I just don't feel this somehow today in the 20th century. I, I just feel that we've gone through so much in this, in, in this century and survived. People have gone through far more, you know, terrifying things and survived. I just do see man as a heroic animal. Or oh, anybody else wants to look at the work someone like me does and give good money for it. Amazing. Why don't they just do their own? I'm not interested in somebody else's work unless I can steal from it. <laughs>